In this video I'm going to be talking about a project which I did at university which was all about using museum specimens and historical records to understand how sedge warbler populations have changed in the past. So sedge warblers are small brown birds, they're members of the Acrocephalus genus of warblers. So these are the ones that could live in kind of reed beds and marshes and stuff. Uh, so you'll see them at a lot of kind of RSPB nature reserves and things like that. And they spend the winter in West Africa, where they spend the winter in these big swamps. And the size of these swamps is determined by how much rainfall there is that year. Because they're kind of seasonal, like the swamps are not there all year, they just sort of fluctuate with the amount of rainfall. People already know that the population size of sedge warblers changes from year to year. And this is correlated with the amount of rainfall which is experienced in West Africa in the previous wintering season. So when there's more rain, the swamps are larger, and therefore more warblers can survive, and therefore the population coming back to the breeding grounds in Europe the next year is larger. And I wanted to see whether this was also true in the late 19th and early 20th century. But because no one was surveying sedge warblers in a kind of repeatable way, no one was doing the same surveys year after year, because no one was doing that, we need another way of inferring how the population was responding to rainfall. So this is where the museum specimens come in, and I use a technique called telochronology, which is where you measure the growth bars on feathers. When they're in the wintering range, the sedge warblers molt their feathers and they grow a whole new set of flight feathers, which they use to migrate back to Europe. And when birds grow their feathers, they normally have loads of very faint bars along the, the length of the feather. And the width of these bars is dependent on the rate at which the feather is growing. So when the feather grows really fast, the bars are much wider. And then when it's growing slowly, the bars are narrower. Uh, so it's a little bit like tree rings, in that when the birds have a lot more food, the, bird, the, the uh, feathers grow faster and therefore the bars are wider. Uh, and people have shown this doing experiments in captivity where they experimentally vary the amount of food that they're giving to individual birds and then they measure the width of the bars. So I measured the width of the bars on the tail on a load of sedge warblers which were collected between around 1834 and 1945. Uh, and I did this using the collections of the Cambridge Zoology Museum and also the Tring Natural History Museum which is a branch of the, the NHM uh, but it's actually outside London. And then I plotted the width of the bars in each year against the amount of rainfall in that year. And I just got this from a previous study that had looked at the amount of rainfall in West Africa. So then I plotted these two things and I found that there was a positive, a weak positive correlation between these two variables. So that suggests that when there is more rain, the sedge warblers are growing their feathers faster. And then you can measure this like you know, 150 years later in the width of the bars. So this is quite interesting, but really when you're kind of investigating a question about something in the past, you really want to have multiple lines of evidence because that makes your conclusion more reliable if you've got two different methods which are both pointing to the same result. So I needed to find another way of inferring how the sedge warbler populations were responding to rainfall. So the way I did this was using historical records so I said that people didn't record sedge warblers in a repeatable way, and this is true. No one did a kind of repeated survey every year where they could clearly see the changes in population. But people did still record them. They would have just sort of done it in like a nature diary or like, you know, notebooks or, or maybe they found a dead one and donated it to a museum or something. So there are all these kind of random opportunistic records. And a lot of these things are now online uh, in a database called GBIF. Uh, which stands for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, and so you can look at pretty much like any species of bird, or at least something that's quite common. Uh, you can see all these records of where people have recorded it every year and stuff. So I wanted to know whether these records uh, that people are making every year could be used as an estimate of the population size of the sedge warblers. So to do this, I compa compared the number of opportunistic records from GBIF each year against the population size from the breeding bird survey which is done by the British Trust for Ornithology and this is a very repeatable survey so a load of volunteers do the same method every year 
So we know that it is quite a reliable estimate of the actual population size. So I plotted these two things and then I found that there was kind of hardly any correlation at all, like nothing, nothing was really happening. So this kind of suggests that the number of opportunistic records is not really very representative of the actual population size. And this is kind of quite obvious really because if someone just goes out and randomly records birds, then the amount of birds they see is more dependent on how hard they're looking for them and also how many people are going out and doing that. So it's not actually representative of how many birds there actually are. So for my study this wasn't very useful because I couldn't really say that much about how the population was changing in the late 19th and early 20th century. But this, this result is still quite useful for kind of designing our citizen science projects today. So a lot of people do citizen science projects and it is really useful, but this data could be much more useful if we sort of eliminate a lot of the biases in the recording. So a lot of people only record sort of charismatic things, or they might only go to, you know, particular popular locations like nature reserves and stuff, uh, or they might, you know, not go to the same place every year. So that means that this data isn't particularly useful for looking at population trends. Um, so how it can be made more useful is if you make sure that you record everything that you see. Uh, you also can record like how long you spent looking for stuff, or so how much effort you put in. Uh, and also if you can go to a wide variety of places and keep going back to the same places year after year. And then we can see these kind of yearly patterns uh, if you do a repeatable method like that. So I guess the overall conclusion of this study was kind of not that great, like I didn't actually find that much. Um, but I still think it's quite important to sort of talk about these kind of studies that didn't go very well. Uh, firstly because, you know, it makes, it kind of can make people feel bad if you think that everyone is being successful, but actually it's just because you're only hearing about the people that were successful. And probably a lot of people's studies actually don't go very well, they don't find very much. And then also it's quite useful to kind of know that there are limitations in, in kind of some of the approaches that people are applying, some of the scientific methods that we're using. And then that can help, you know, knowing that, that these things don't work means that we can then design like better ways of, of measuring stuff. But yeah, even though this study wasn't very conclusive, uh, I think it did sort of really make me think how much information there is in museum specimens and in, in historical records. So there are like millions and millions of museum specimens and you know, it's amazing that you can measure the growth bars of, of sedge warblers that were collected like 150 or almost 200 years ago. So if you just think, you know, with the, the kind of things that we can measure and like CT scanning of skeletons and stuff, there must be so much information that we could gain about, about how animals have experienced conditions in the past and stuff from looking at all these museum specimens. Uh, and then that can be really useful for kind of understanding and predicting like how species might respond to changes in the future. So, you know, if we can look at like how things responded to climate in the past and we might know like how they're going to respond to climate change in the future. Uh, and then also it can be really useful for kind of reconstructing baselines of populations. And this is especially true for historical records like sort of journals and diaries that people have made. These can be really useful for understanding how people have been affecting the natural world in the time before we really started recording it in a scientific way. Uh, so this is really important if we're interested in kind of nature restoration and we want to know kind of what sort of baseline we want to be aiming for if we're going to be restoring an ecosystem to a more kind of natural and abundant state. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video and if you'd like to see more of my videos please do subscribe to my YouTube channel and I think I'll be doing more of these kind of sciencey videos in the future. So yeah, thanks for watching, goodbye.